I'm excited today to see how a God of miracles is going to surprise us. Amen. I love that. If you're a guest with us today, I'd especially like to welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us here at Crossbridge. Whether you are with us in person, you're joining us online, I'm glad you're here. I want you to know that my hope and my prayer for you is the same as it is every single week that we gather, and that's no matter where you find yourself in your faith today, I hope and I pray that you are able to take one step towards Jesus, because that's what we're all about here. Amen. That's what we do at Crossbridge. We want to go after Jesus, and we are today going to be uh, final, you know, completing our series on prayer, and this has just been a quick three-part series, and it's been, to me, it's been, I love being able to talk about prayer, and I feel like we could do this for weeks and weeks and weeks and still never exhaust the topic. I mean, we've been talking about it for millennia, and it's, it's something that we, we kind of discuss is a little difficult to do sometimes, if we're being honest, right? That, that we, we know we want to do it, but sometimes we struggle with wanting, not wanting to do it, but how do I do it? And so we've been looking at some practical ways, and we talked about the, the types of prayer, different types of prayer that we can lean into. So week one was the prayer of contemplation. How can I contemplate who God is and really pause in the silence and embrace that he loves me? And then last week we talked about prayers of petition where we go to God for our daily bread, and we also need to be stopping and thanking him and praising him for all the things he has and, and, and will yet do in our lives. And then today, it's funny, I, I began to look at how I planned this series out a couple months ago, and I went, why do I always pick hard topics? Like, I could give those to Will. I, 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 that's, that's what I really should be doing here, is passing these tough ones off and go, oh, Pastor Will's got that, He's, no problem. I find myself picking topics to teach on in, in areas like this that are a little difficult, not because they're going to be difficult for you, but there's something that I wrestle with, and I want to know more about what God is doing in that in my own life. And so today, again, we're going to be looking at something that may be a bit uncomfortable, and I'm telling you that up front because uh, I think it'll be fun to watch people squirm a little bit today. And I can welcome you into that with me, that, that the, the type of prayer that we talk about today is going to be one that is a stretch for many of us and uncomfortable for many of us, yet it's something that we see so constant throughout scriptures and especially in the life of Jesus. And I, I will say, a couple weeks ago I had the privilege of, uh, of preaching at youth group and had a blast with these teenagers. Our teenagers here at Crossbridge are absolutely amazing. I hope you know that. They are amazing. Um, it was so much fun, and, and I was like, this is great. But one of the things that I love most about teenagers is that they haven't been indoctrinated by adults when it comes to reading the Bible yet. Okay, let me explain this for a second. They actually believe what Jesus says. They haven't convinced themselves out of it. They believe if Jesus says it and Jesus says to do it, they're like, so why shouldn't I do that? As adults, we're like, well, maybe, you know, it's a good idea, but I don't know if I should do it. Teenagers are ready to do it if Jesus says it. And I love it because today what we're looking at is something that Jesus says to do, and we should do it. But it's also something and a type of prayer that can be confusing. I have often heard what we're going to be looking at used to shame people, used to guilt people. I have been told because things didn't happen when we pray certain ways that my faith wasn't great enough, that there was still something wrong in my life because God chose not to move. When we talk about the type of healing and the type of confession that we need in prayer, that God, when we pray, wants to forgive our sins and wants to bring healing to our life, so often these topics of prayer are, beat, are used to beat us, to confess sins that like, you know, you, you need to get this all out and, and, and if you miss anything, you're the worst. It's like, whoa, 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 there's a lot going on. Like, there's always new depths to sin in our life. How do we do this well? And when it comes to healing, I've heard so many times, if you had more faith, it would have been done. There's something wrong with your prayers. And, and I'll be honest, it's really, really hard. But I have seen God move in these ways. And when I get to walk with people where confession is heard, forgiveness is received, so often, do you know the text that I receive later is, uh, life feels so different what, what happened today that feels so different? I'm like, what do you mean? How are you feeling? And the phrase always is, I feel lighter. Is there anybody else here today that wants to feel lighter? 
that you feel like the weight of this uh, world that we're living in the last couple of weeks, let alone uh, the last couple of decades for many of our life, they've been heavy. They've been hard. There's, there's things that feel broken. There's this weight that's sitting on us going, I, I, would, I would long to feel lighter. This is the offering that Jesus gives to us is to, to feel lighter by stepping into confession. Confession is not a problem. It is a gift. It's a gift. And healing is something that God promises us. And if I could already see some of you looking a little like, wait, when you say healing, what do you mean? What are you, what are you, what are you talking about here? Well, I, I, I want to look at what it means to pray through what Jesus' half-brother James, he writes to a church, and, and this is what he says at the end of chapter 5 of his letter to this church, starting in verse 13, James 5. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was as, as human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Maybe that's what someone prayed for us in Jersey right now. All right. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. Now, I know in this passage there's probably a lot to, that we could go over and work through, um, but in three very quick verses, I love that James has summed up how almost most of our lives are spent. Are you suffering? Mm-hmm. Are you happy? Mm-hmm. Are you sick? Mm-hmm. Most of our life is going to be spent suffering hardships, being happy, or sick. This is what life is filled with. And it's like, all right, cool. James has a great answer. What do you do when you're in one of these situations? His answer is the same for all of them. Pray. Whether you're suffering hardships, happiness, or sick, the answer to all of these life situations is the same. It is to pray. And I know some of you might be thinking, yeah, he says sing praises if you're happy. But let me tell you, when you sing praises, this is prayer. Prayer is a, an offering that we give to God. And when we are sitting together in this corporate community and we begin to worship God through song, unless, unless you're singing this song to the person next to you, which would be highly awkward, right? If you're looking at them saying, there's another in the fire standing next to me. They're like, they're just, it's weird, isn't it? Uh, if you're singing and you're staring up at the ceiling looking at, you know, gym lights, or if you're, you're at home and in your living room and you're looking up at your ceiling and you're singing to your ceiling, that's not prayer. That's just singing. But when we are praising God for who he is, this is communication with God. This is time with God. This is prayer. And so whether you've got hardships, whether you are happy, whether you are sick, the answer is the same. We are called to pray. And very few situations in, the life, in our life fall outside this summary. We are called to pray. And, and when James begins to tell this to the church, they're probably not surprised because, you know, church tradition for James, the half-brother of Jesus, was that he was known as a man of prayer. Like this was one of the things that he was, was known for and celebrated for. In fact, the tradition says that he spent so much time in prayer that his knees were so hard and calloused. Like that, that's, that's who he was. I don't know if that's true or not. But I can tell you if they said this about him, whether there's callous knees or not, the man you have to know was committed to prayer enough to where they would even joke about it. This is who he was. He knew that prayer made a huge impact in his faith and what he did. And so are you in trouble? Okay, pray. Are you happy? Songs of praise, pray. Are you sick? I love this one because he says, don't just pray by yourself. Are you sick? Call the elders of the church to go and to anoint you with oil and to pray over you. I can already see some of you squirming a little bit right now. I hold up oil, and you're like, wait, that was in the passages. Is he going to ask us to do this? Yes, I am. 
I am. You're fine with, are you happy? Pray. Are you in hardships? Pray. But the sickness one? That, that's, Jimmy, no, 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 no. I don't know. That one feels different for healing. I mean, maybe, maybe James was just saying this to the first century church. I mean, they didn't have the medical technology we had now, right? They didn't have the tech to figure out what was going on with a, a, a heart that wasn't operating correctly. They couldn't scan it or the brain to scan it. They, couldn't, they didn't have the antibiotics that we have today. So, yeah, that's, you know, the, migraines were different. And we, we've got better technology now. So I'm sure what James is saying is, hey, in the first century, you need to pray for healing because you don't have the advances we have today. Nope. Nope, I, I don't think so at all, because James doesn't tell us, and, and neither does Jesus, that when you get the tech and when you get the medicine, you no longer need to pray. When, when humans discover certain things, then you no longer need me. Nope, we need Jesus more now than we have ever needed him. We need him now more than we have ever needed him. And you will not find anywhere in the Bible where Jesus or any of the apostles teach you don't have to do this anymore. Instead, you actually see it lived out in the life of Jesus. He's writing to churches. James is writing to churches that, that likely knew or had people in their churches who knew Jesus, who knew him, who knew what he did in his three years of ministry. They would have known that, that like, if you were to look at the biography of Jesus written by Mark, just the first three chapters are filled with story after story after story of him bringing healing to different people. It was just part of what he did. And they weren't about showing off. He was just living out what he said he was going to do. Check it out. In, in the gospel, the story of Jesus from Mark in chapter 1, he just says, he says, later on, after John, and John is uh, referring to John the Baptist. This is Jesus' cousin. After John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached the good news the time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe in the good news. And what's cool is from this point on, from verse 15 or 14 and 15 on, Jesus does throughout the rest of Mark exactly what he said. His goal is to reveal to the people around him how the kingdom of God looks like. If it is near, this is what you need to look forward to. This is what you can see happening when the kingdom of God is here. And if you just go ahead, jump down in that same chapter 1 to verse 30. We see Jesus hanging out at his best friend's house, Simon Peter. And it says, now Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. They told Jesus about her right away. And so he went to her bedside, took her by the hand, and helped her sit up. Then the fever left her. And she prepared a meal for them. I mean, come on, it was just a fever, right? It's a high fever. Maybe, maybe Jesus just kind of paused for a second, realized that it was about to break. And he, and he went into the room at just the opportune time and held her hand and lifted her up when, you know, it, the, the fever broke, she was feeling better. Maybe, maybe that's just what happened. It wasn't really a miraculous healing. I, I don't think we can even go down that road. You know Why? Because if it wasn't miraculous, why in the world would the rest of the town following this passage show up at the door? If they didn't know that Simon's mother-in-law was that sick, and in communities they knew who was sick and they cared for these people, if they didn't know how sick she was, it's, oh, it's just a little one. No, this was a big deal. And the entire town says, that shouldn't have happened. She should not be better yet. And they show up at the door. And right after this, right after this in another city, it's amazing. Jesus is approached by a man with leprosy. And, and leprosy is used throughout the New Testament as a, um, it's like a catch-all for skin diseases. We, we have a different definition of leprosy now, but there was, if anything was off with the skin, for the most part, they would start categorizing it under the umbrella of leprosy. And if someone had leprosy, you would never go near them, never touch them, never be around them. And so, what do we find? This man who's now an outcast in his community. He, he goes to Jesus. As people flee from this man, he flees to Jesus. And in verse 40, it says, a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of him, begging to be healed. If you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. And I love this. Moved with, with what? What is Jesus moved with? He's moved with compassion. 
Jesus reached out and touched him. Can I tell you, when's the last time this man was touched by anyone? And Jesus said, I am willing. He said, be healed. And when does this happen? What happens? When? Instantly. Instantly the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. Listen, even though this is still chapter 1 of Mark, chapter 1, the news that Jesus can heal people, heal miraculously gets out. And all around this region, people know and they begin to flock to him, whether they're sick with fevers, they can't walk, they can't see, they can't hear. If they've got terminal illnesses, it doesn't matter. And, and they are all flocking. And then when you get to chapter 2, he kind of heads to his home base that he spends time in, in this place called Capernaum. And so everyone, when he's kind of heading home, is like, Jesus is coming home. And they bum rush for him. They, like, overwhelm him going, there's sick people here. Can you do this? It's so full in this town that Jesus begins to teach in one of these houses, and it's packed wall to wall with people. They can't fit any more in there. And here he is kind of sitting, and he's teaching, and people are standing. And then there's someone from the town who can't walk. And he's got four friends who are so committed to him. And these four friends put him on his mat, they lift him up, and they take him up the stairs to the place where Jesus is teaching because they can't get in. They don't know what to do. So they climb up these stairs. They wiggle their way up to the roof, which all the roofs there are flat. So it's not like they're jumping on one of our roofs that are peaked. It's a flat roof. And and they're up there. And usually there's tiles that are up there. And they begin to pull the tiles off of the the roof. And they're putting them in piles. And then it's, it's made with this dirt clay, um, a hay, and palm branches, that that's how they got it so sturdy. And these four men begin to dig through the roof. This isn't their house. This is not first century etiquette that it's okay to dig through someone else's roof. There's no explanation for this other than they believed so much that Jesus could heal their friend that they were willing to incur the cost of someone else's roof as they dig and they dig and they dig. I don't know how long it took them to get through, but I know that the people inside, there had to come a point when, you know, the dust starts falling in the room, and they're like, what's going on? I I wonder what it was like when they were sitting there, and then the first hand comes through the roof. Who freaks out first? Uh, That'd be me. That that would be me. I don't do scary things. A hand goes through the roof. I'm going to scream like a junior high girl, and out I run. Like, that's just going to scare me. But but they do it. They, They dig through the roof. And they dig through it so much that they can create a space for their friend on a mat. And then together they work, one, two, one, two, to lower him down directly in front of Jesus. Can you see this scene? How crazy is this? People are probably backing up. Like, what are you doing? You can't cut the line. Can we cut through houses now? What are, like, what are they doing? What's happening in here? And they lay him right in front of Jesus. And Jesus sees this man in the mat And then he looks up. He looks up at the friends. For your second, just close your eyes for me. If you were a friend of this man who couldn't walk, and you did all this work lowering him down, what look would be on your face as you looked at Jesus? Are you expectant? Are you hungry? Are you nervous? Are you worried? Now imagine the face of Jesus looking at you. What's it look like? Is it encouraged? Is it loving? Is it confused? Stay on that roof with your eyes closed because... What Jesus sees in you as that person, it says in Mark chapter 2 that seeing their faith and what Jesus sees in your eyes, your facial expression as you look down is faith, faith that he could do something. You can open your eyes. Jesus sees faith in those who are willing to risk. Seeing their faith, Jesus said in verse 5, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, he now puts his attention to who's in front of him, my child, your sins are forgiven. 
What? That's just what you came to do as a friend, isn't it? That's why you dug through the roof, is so that your friend's sins would be forgiven, isn't it? No. No, we, we wanted our friend to be healed, right? That's what we were looking for here. And so they, they, they came hoping that Jesus would heal their friend and he would be able to walk out. Why would Jesus say something like this? He's been healing people all over the place. This is a new thing for him in this moment. And here's why. I believe that when, when the Bible talks about miraculous healings, when the Bible talks about these miracles, they are not solely physical. If you have, are now thinking, well, well, God can heal physical things, that's cool. God does way more than heal that. Let me tell you, the miraculous healings of God are not just physical. They are uh, mental. They are emotional. They are relational. They are, oh man, it starts at salvation. They are, they are spiritual. Us being forgiven of our sin and going from being broken to be made whole, from blind to seeing in this spiritual world, that's a miracle, Amen. That is a miracle that that God could forgive us, and that's the place to start. With all of us, we've experienced this miraculous healing if we've placed our hope in Jesus. And here's what I love, is that in this moment, the man's legs are an issue, but they are not the biggest issue this man is dealing with. They're not the biggest problem that he has to deal with. It's his spiritual need that's a greater need in this moment. And when Jesus brings this healing, he's bringing healing to something this guy didn't even know he needed. He didn't even go for that reason. And and internally, what's cool is there's these guys called the Pharisees. They're the the professional teachers in the Jewish community. And and they begin to ask this question going like, uh, so, like, (laughs) you can just say that to people now? Like, you could just say your sins are forgiven? They don't say any of this out loud. Most of the time when God's doing something miraculous, we don't always question it out loud. We question it in our head. We want to know why. I, I don't have a problem with the Pharisees' question here. I think it's actually really good. And I think we, we, we should be asking good questions and real questions when it comes to things like this. But that's exactly what they do. They start thinking and they wonder, wait, can't God be the only one who says something like that? Jump to verse 8 with me. It says this, Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them. Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat and walk? I love this. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or pick up your mat and walk? Now, this is an easy answer. If you're like, Jesus, wrong answer. Here's the easy answer. It's so much easier to say, your sins are forgiven. Do you know why? There's no proof. I don't have to do anything to prove that to you. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Oh, that's great. I, 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 you'll never know. Now, if someone's laid in front of you, they can't walk and they haven't been able to, and you say, pick up your mat and walk, can you measure that? Yeah, absolutely. So which is easier? It's so much easier to say your sins are forgiven because no one can prove if it happened or didn't. And so Jesus continues, verse 10, he says, So, I'll prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man, he said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. You know, this man jumped up and walked out. God didn't just heal whatever was going on. He gave him muscle mass. He gave him the ability to jump. Did you ever fall asleep, uh, have your like, leg fall asleep on you, and you try to stand up, and you know you do the stumble, or you're like, oh my gosh, get up, it takes a little while. Imagine not having facil- any use of your legs whatsoever, and then all of a sudden you're healed. You'd be a little hesitant. There'd be a, what can I do? This man's so excited, he knows something has changed, so much to the fact that he gets up, jumps up. I love that. He jumps up in excitement, picks up his mac- mat, and as he walks out, you know everyone's like, what, 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 what just happened here? Remember, this is Jesus' home base. They know what's going on. They knew this man. He came for physical healing, and he ran out spiritually restored and physically healed. And let me tell you, Jesus never stopped healing and has never stopped it. 
And he's commissioned his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything I've commanded you to do. He never commanded us to stop praying for healing. He never commanded us to stop asking our good father to bring healing to areas of our life. And this is exactly what his brother James says to do. He says, if you're in trouble, you pray. If you're happy, you praise. And if you're sick, you pray for healing. You pray for healing and the Lord will make you well. I believe that we have a God who does continue to bring healing to us. I, I have seen miraculous healings. I have seen God heal people from incurable diseases. I, I have seen and been part of moments to pray over people walking in with crutches or in wheelchairs who left them at an altar and walked out, never needing them again. I, I, have, I have been part of moments to pray over people where cancer has mysteriously just disappeared and no one understands why where migraines have been released, where fevers have been broken, where relationships have been restored, where depression has been delivered, where anxiety has been released. I, I have seen God do the miraculous. I have seen it. I've been a part of it. I have received it. But I have also been part of moments to pray over people where uh, we pray for healing and nothing happens. Depression stays. That wheelchair didn't, didn't stay at the altar. It rolled right back out. That cancer actually grew fiercely from that point. I've prayed with people here at Crossbridge with our elders. Where nothing's happened. Nothing. God chose not to heal. I, I tell you that because... Um, I used to get really discouraged in those moments, like I did something wrong. Like if, if, if we prayed for something and it happened, I'm like, oh good, God must be happy with me. And if we prayed for people and nothing happened, did I do something wrong? Do I not have the faith? Do they not have faith? What's wrong with this? Because it says that, that if we pray, healing's gonna happen. What do we do? I, I, I remember a season where we were praying all the time for people and God was just choosing not to heal and it wasn't happening and it was little things to big things. It didn't matter. We just kept praying. Nothing was happening and I'm, I'm, I love you, Crossbridge. I'm being honest with you that, that it really was hard for me to continue to want to pray because I'm thinking, God, did you just stop doing this? Do you not care about the, about the people at Crossbridge? Do you not care how, uh, this is selfish. Do, God, do you not care how this makes me look? Like I'm supposed to lead and if I can't lead in this, then, then who's going to come for prayer? Who's going to want to do this? Lord, this is what you've told me to do as an elder. And I kept asking these very difficult questions. Yes, I would, I would pray for people when they asked, and I feel like they checked the box, but I will be honest, my prayers felt weak. They felt weak. And the questions that kept coming to me is, why, why, God, why did you choose to heal some people, but you didn't heal them? Has anybody else ever asked that question besides me, please? Okay, thank you. I, I always wonder this. God, why would you choose then them and not them? Like, wh wh Why? God, why did you let someone who's so godly, so wonderful, so, has such a ministry, why did you let them die? They were young, they had a family, you could have done something and you didn't. Why? If you've never prayed these prayers, you're missing out because God's big enough to handle them. Oh, he's so good. He's so good and big enough to handle them. I pray these all the time. I... I, I I would say, God, why, why, why would I even encourage people to come and ask us to pray? If you're going to do what you're going to do anyway, if you're sovereign and you're in control of all things and you know who you're going to heal and who you're not and you're, you, you're doing all this, then what's the point of even praying if you're going to do what you're going to do anyway? You're just going to do it. I was worried about looking like an idiot. How this made me look. And I confess that to you because I've prayed so many times and I've seen healings and thought, oh, this is great. And when I didn't see them, there's something about the disappointment on someone's face that God chose not to move that I feel like was my responsibility to try to fix. 
I don't have answers to any of those questions. But here's what I've come to understand. Crossbridge, God is more loving, more compassionate, more caring, and more sovereign than any of us are. He just is. He knows what we don't know. He understands what we can't understand. He is aware of what we are far unaware of. He knows what's going on in our lives better than we know what's going on in our lives. His ways are higher than our ways. And there are times we will just never understand why he chooses to or not to do something. And that's part of faith. Faith is understanding that we don't understand. Faith is knowing that we will never know sometimes. Why does God choose to heal some and and not others? I don't know. I have no idea. But I know that he has never, ever diminished his loving, committed, compassionate, caring, sovereignty characteristics. They have never gone down. They have always stayed consistent. He will always be that way. I understand that he has not called us to heal people. We can't do that. Did you know that? You, You can't heal people. Even if God gives you the spiritual gift of healing, that's not you. That's God through you. Here's what's great. He doesn't call me, and I believe he doesn't call all followers of Jesus to heal people. What he does is he calls us to pray for the sick to be healed. That's what he calls us to do. When we allow our lives, whether we are happy, whether we are in trouble, or whether we are sick, when we allow our lives to be defined by prayer, we have the ability then to pray with boldness, to pray with expectancy, and to have great understanding that God is sovereign and we are not. And the truth is, since he's sovereign over all things, he knows what's best. He's just inviting us to pray with him, to be part of these moments when God chooses to heal. Yes, we're going to celebrate when he chooses not to heal. He's still worth celebrating. He's still good. He's still loving, and God can still redeem the pain. Do you know God works in our sickness to reveal things in us sometimes? He allows us to stay sick to show us things. How many times are we trying to pray away the things that he's asking us to power through? So what should we pray for him? What shouldn't we? I don't know. I'm going to keep going to God with everything. And if he's going to leave it, I'll receive it. But if he's going to heal me, I'll receive that too. And if he chooses not to move, it's okay. And at the end of this little passage, James encourages us. He says, you know, yes, you need to go to the, the elders for prayer and for healing. But listen, he says, I-, I want you to confess your sins to one another to receive healing. <laughs> So often, especially in the evangelical tradition, we have taken confession as a very private thing. When we sin, it's just important for me to go to God and confess my sins. Yes, that is true. Uh, 1 John 1, 9 reminds us that if we confess our sins, God's faithful, that he's just. He'll forgive us our sins. He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, we are accountable to him and to him alone for the sin in our life, sin being anything that displeases him, that we think, we say, we do. Anytime we're not loving God and loving people, this is sin. So there's plenty of it for us to confess. But what James says, I love this, confess your sins to one another. No, we don't like that one, do we? No, no, we don't need to do that. That's the thing the Catholic Church does. You go into your little booth so that you don't know who you're saying, and you just you, you tell them all the things you've done wrong. They'll tell you what you do to make it better, and you're good to go. And then you can walk out scot-free, and it's like, all right, good. So now we don't even have the booth. It's just me and God. Yes, you are forgiven. And how many times do we just go to God? And then within an hour, we're back to God with that same sin. In an hour, we're back to God with that same sin. God, how many times do I have to confess anger or lust or pride to you? Well, for as long as we struggle with it, but do you know what helps is when we confess to one another, we're then held accountable. We need to hear the words of Christ in our own life where he has said, you are forgiven. And Jesus tells us that when when someone asks for forgiveness, you tell them they're forgiven. When they confess sin, you have the ability to remind them, you are forgiven. Not that we can forgive things, but Christ has forgiven them. Sometimes, and I love this, I've got three or four people that I have a regular appointment with to confess my sin. They know it all. And when I sin, I try to be so quick to confess it right now. Not just to God, but to people. When I'm wrestling, I need someone to know that. You know why? Because it's really hard for me. And, and I have a great friend who once said, uh, I love when he says it. He always says, he says, confession is bad 
for the reputation, but good for the soul. It's bad for the reputation. These, these men in my life that know all the sin in my life that I can conceivably think about and try to get out into the open for them, the, man, it's messy. I sin less than I did before as God's continuing to, to, to sanctify my life. But man, it's still there. And I need this every day. And I'm glad for the accountability to it because then when I'm struggling with anger, the next time they see me, do you know what they ask? Hey, I've been praying for that in your life. How's your anger issue been? Oh man, I know they're going to ask me that. So you know what? It makes me think when I'm ready to lash out on something. Wait a second. They're going to ask me, and I'm always going to tell them the truth. Do I want to confess sin or do I want to pursue Jesus? And just because I know I confess to them and they're going to ask me, it helps me live a more holy life. They point me towards Jesus. Isn't that great? But so often we look at confession, if they knew, if they knew, oh, what would they think about me? I'll just give you a heads up. If you look at the person next to you, they're far more messed up than you think they are. They just are. And if you're thinking, not me, oh, you're more blind than you think. You just are. So how do you know? How do you know then if you're blind? I think you've got to go back to the passage that Brianna read for us from King David in Psalm 139. If you want to learn how to confess sin as a form of prayer, not just to God, but to each other, we've got to go back to what it says. We pray, and it's the last two verses of Psalm 139, where it says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. I believe we need to spend more time using that contemplative time of silence with God to to feel his love for us because it should lead us to a place of confession, which is a gift. The Lord will never lead us to confess sin and feel guilty or shameful about it. He frees us from our sin. Yes, there are consequences to this, absolutely. But he loves us. And there's nothing that any of us could ever do that will diminish his love for us. So Crossbridge, hear me. We need to live a life of confession. If we are going to choose to pray without ceasing in our life, let's just start a confession. There's always something going on, Lord. Search me and know me. See if there's something that's off. Where am I not trusting you? Where am I snapping at people? Where am I off with the loving my family, loving my kids, loving my friends? Where, Where am I off? Reveal it, not not so that I feel like garbage, but reveal it so that I can say to you, I'm sorry. And when we've sinned against each other, we can confess it to each other. One of the things I love most about the life groups here at Crossbridge is you confess sin to each other. You hold each other accountable. What a gift you give to each other. What a gift I receive as a member of a small group. The reason I tell you this is because I believe that there's people here that healing is something we're scared to ask for, but you're sick. You have no problem praising and you have no problem praying when you're happy, but you're sick. There's things that are, you're dealing with internally you don't know what to do with and you're like, doctors don't have answers. I know this because I've prayed with you and there are things I, I've, I've begged with God for you and with you together and God still has chosen not to heal and it's so easy to give up. I know this, I've been praying the same prayer for over a decade for healing in in someone's life and he's chosen not to. And it's so easy to say, I want to give up. But James never says, after so long, when the tech is there or God doesn't answer, go ahead and give up. Never says it. And so we continue to pray. Today, I want to give you the opportunity. It'd be horrible for us to say, hey, if you need us to pray, just go ahead and jump in the app and we'll pray for you. No, today, what we're going to do um, is instead of celebrating communion by gathering and coming back together and receiving it, is, uh, man, if you need to be prayed for, if there's something that you feel is broken that you're like, I, I would really love for God to bring healing to this area, or there is a sin that is sitting on your heart so heavy that you've never had the opportunity to forgive or to, to express that you feel like it's been weighing so hard and you just need to be reminded that you're forgiven. 
Our elders will be on the side, ready with oil to anoint and to pray for you. They'll be ready to hear if there's something you need to confess or if you, you have someone in your small group or life group that, that you want to confess your sin to, go, take it, take the opportunity. You don't, it doesn't have to be an elder that you get confess your sin to. It says confess your sin to one another. Just do me a favor. If there's something heavy, don't go to someone you don't know and be like, I've got to tell you. Okay, so that's, uh, we need, we need, this is part of relationship. Okay, I don't confess all my sin to you or to, uh, you know, my small groups. I have certain things that are areas for my closest friends that they know. But today, what's sitting on you? What's weighing you down? What have you been carrying that you're saying, I need a miracle and I'm willing to line up outside the door and do whatever it takes to get to Jesus. And when we pray together, let me just tell you how this will be. We're gonna, we're gonna ask the very words of Jesus that he asks of Bartimaeus when he's sitting on the side of the road. He can't see and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? It seems like a dumb question, doesn't it? He's blind. It's not a dumb question. What is it that, that you want God to do for you? And then we're gonna anoint you with oil and just put it right here on your head and then we're gonna pray for you. And if God does the miraculous that you've been asking for, we're gonna celebrate with you. And we're gonna say, this is great. Let's go tell the story of Jesus and what he's doing. And, and if he chooses not to heal you, we're gonna celebrate with you because you acted in obedience. You, you did nothing but put yourself before God saying, I'm willing to try again. I'm willing to put myself here in this position because I know you love me no matter what. I can't wait to see what God does because I know he's a God who loves us and who is faithful and whether he heals or whether he doesn't, all he asks us to do is to obey. And so Crossbridge, let's take the faith of our teenagers who when they read the stories of Jesus haven't disqualified them yet, they believe it. Let's step in to saying, God, this is what I need. Would you stand with me as we prepare for communion? And what I'll encourage you to do is after I pray, um, there'll be a set of elders over here, over here, um, ready to pray. And you may go and you can normally, we gather communion, come back. You can break, you can dip and receive it with the people around the table. Just kind of, we see you. This is the body of Christ that's been broken for us and, and his blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. If you've chosen not to follow Jesus or you haven't been in that place where you're still wrestling through that, please do not um, take communion. This is for those of us who have followed Christ. And I want to encourage you that if um, you'd like to stay and you're thinking, I don't know if I want to risk being prayed for, but I kind of want to watch what's going on. I, I just want to see. Hang out. Pray for those who are being prayed for. Just sit and and... Take this time to pray, confess, ask God for whatever it is that you want. But I would encourage you to connect with each other. Use the hall. Use the coffee area. Let's allow this place to be a holy place, amen? Jesus, we offer ourselves to you. We simply ask, Holy Spirit, that you would search us and know us. God, would you reveal anything that's in us that where sin has been weighing so hard and it needs to be released. And oh, I thank you for so often how you, you bring healing as we confess sin because it just destroys our insides, which affects our whole body. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would dig deep and you would allow us to confess well, to receive the forgiveness that you have for us. Lord, for those who need the spirit of courage, <laughs> Would you give them the courage today to say, I'll, I'll risk one more time? And knowing you will never disappoint us, but we will never stop asking until you choose to make it clear what you want of us. Holy Spirit, would you have your way? Jesus, would you be glorified? It's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may go receive communion as you head out and we'll be right on the sides ready to pray for you.